As a teenager, I lived for some time in Tokumaru Bay. At the northern end of Tokumaru Bay, a small little township called Waima. Kia went from Waima. And this is a time before all the flash two-story mansions took their places there, when houses were a little bit more humble and people were a little poorer. But what we made up, or what we lacked in wealth, we made up for in character, I think, those of us that lived there. Not only character, but characters. The people that lived there you wouldn't read about. Outstanding, funny, strange people. And oddly in the mix, people that of themselves were absolutely world class. I can remember a guy called Kim Elkington, whose guitar skills were just unbelievable. A world class flamenco and lead guitarist. He would sit on our porch, fingers blazing across the fretboard, while the rest of us teenagers tried to keep up with him. And he'd regale us with stories of his time at Brigham Young University in Hawaii, where he learned to play the guitar by dodging the classes that he should have been attending. Or there was Phil Kururanga, some of you might be related to him. At one point, I think in the late 70s, he was rated as the sixth strongest man in the world. He represented New Zealand at the Commonwealth Games, had an unfortunate incident where his leotards tore in the middle of a great lifting. But this man had immense strength. We went to a church service I once at a, a church in Gisborne, and he was hemmed in by a mini. Uh, his car was hemmed in by a mini. And his solution? He picked it up and moved it. He was also a fourth darn black belt in Aikido. So he'd come and mix with us teenagers and teach us how to do all these fantastic Asian tricks. He had this one particular trick where he would concentrate on a muscle in his abdomen that would make him immovable if he focused. We thought, oh, rubbish. So he leaned on his knees, he concentrated on this muscle, put his arms out, and he said, boys, push me over. About five minutes later, he stopped concentrating, looked up, and saw us sweating and straining, trying to push him over, and began laughing. It was only then that he fell. Truly a world-class man. Another person we had who was world-class in his skill was a potter. And no, he wasn't potting. But he was a potter of some world renown. He was an artist, famous throughout the States for his product. He had a, an artist workshop down by the old freezing works in Weimar, next to the wharf. Um, and he, there he would make his pottery. And before we would cruise around the side of the wharf there, a place we call the rocks, to go and get kina and power and boo-boos when times were hard, we'd stop in and, and see what he was up to and the, the magnificent things that he was building. And you know, he'd take this clay, whatever he had sourced, and he'd wet it, and he'd throw it onto his potter's wheel and begin spinning it and fashioning this clay. And just using his palms and his fingers and his thumbs, he would make all manner of fantastic things. We were amazed by the process. And then he would have certain times during the year where he would fire up his kiln. Before he had a gas kiln, which became all automated and made it much easier, he had a wood-fired kiln, which was an extreme process to watch, because it would take some two or three days for him to fire his pottery in his kiln. He'd have to bring it up to the right temperature, around about 600 degrees, I think, from memory, and he'd have to stoke this thing continually, day and night. And at a certain part of the process, he'd have to be throwing in wood almost every three to five minutes just to keep the temperature up. And when he had finished, out would come the products of his hand, the vessels that he had made from clay and water. And these things would be glossed and would be hardened and would be beautiful. Occasionally, he'd give us a, one or two cups that had cracked during the process because every now and then, there'd be clay, even if, no matter how perfect the process he'd used, the heat would still find impurities and these vessels would still crack. And if he wasn't able to give them away, he would smash them. Because pottery is a very hard thing to get rid of once it's been fired in a kiln. It doesn't just dissolve. That's why you can go to places like Israel and find pottery that is thousands of years old. That's why those ancients chose specific sites to throw them away, because it's not like other rubbish. It lasts and it lasts and it lasts. We learnt a lot from this man, 
in the process that he went through to make these things. One particular day, my friends and I were there in his workshop, and I saw this incredible bowl, a very large bowl that he'd been working on for some weeks. Incredibly detailed, fantastic thing. He had, instead of spinning it on the wheel, he had taken time to mold the clay with his hands and to begin to, to layer this bowl, one strip of clay at a time. And every now and then he would break the sequence and introduce figurines, uh, people, trees, birds, fish. It was a representation of Tokumuru Bay, just an outstanding work of art. And the top layer had all these popo that represented the various marae, iwi and hukui that were around the place. Just an outstanding thing. I was 17 years old and I had to touch it. So I reached out, I picked up this bowl, because I wanted to, to admire its full beauty. And as I lifted, a sound that I didn't want to hear happened. It cracked. And it didn't just break along a seam. No, it chose to shatter. Of course, the first thing I did is I looked to make sure no one had seen me. But there was no escape. I'd been spotted. Everyone in the workshop heard the noise. And the potter, you should have seen his face. It was a mix of terror and anger like you've never seen. You know what, I don't think he's forgiven me since. <laughs> I see him every now and then in Gisborne and I say, oh, kia ora. And he goes, mm. <laughs> He remembers me as a boy. <laughs> that shattered weeks worth of work. <laughs> you see, the problem that I didn't pick up with that particular bowl was that it hadn't been fired in the kiln. It had air dry, it looked hard, it felt hard when I picked it up, but it had no strength. As soon as the pressure of my hands and the pressure of gravity came to bear, it shattered. It let go. And it wasn't the only thing that shattered, the dreams of the bottom. This was meant to be the primary exhibit piece when he travelled to New York. Yeah, his dreams were shattered too. That's why I never forget it. It was quite a lesson. <laughs>